would like to thank Representatives Green, Ellison, Capture, Sarbanes, Jab Hall, all for being here today. I would also like to recognize the consumer groups in the room, including Americans for Financial Reform, Public Citizen, Allied Progress, and the Center for Responsible Lending. Ladies and gentlemen, since we first learned of Wells Fargo's fraudulent account scandal, in which the bank opened up 3.5 million accounts without the knowledge of their customers, I have made it clear that I believe the bank needs to face real consequences for its deeply harmful behavior. Last week, I released a Democratic staff report examining Wells Fargo's egregious consumer abuses. This report is truly eye-opening. It shows that Wells Fargo has made a routine practice of ripping off and preying on their customers in a seemingly never-ending avalanche of scandals in which service members, minorities, homeowners, small business owners, and many other consumers have been targeted and abused by the bank. In addition to the fraudulent account scandal, Wells Fargo has engaged in illegal student loan servicing practices and mortgage lending practices charged consumers for auto insurance policies uh, that they certainly should not have been charged for, did not need, and charged inappropriate checking account overdraft fees. Yet the fines that prudential regulators have required Wells Fargo and other mega banks to pay for their wrongdoing has seemingly amounted to simply the cost of doing business. It is clear that steeper penalties need to be used when a megabank demonstrates a pattern of egregious consumer abuse. But the prudential regulators, which have the capability of shutting down a recidivist megabank, have not exercised that capability, even the most appalling cases of repeated wrongdoing. So today I'm introducing the Mega Bank Accountability and Consequences Act to require the federal prudential banking regulators to fully utilize existing authorities, such as the ability to shut down a mega bank and ban culpable uh, executives and directors from working in the banking industry to stop mega banks that clearly and repeatedly engage in practices that harm consumers. The bill also clarifies and enhances the set of tools available to regulators to ensure that mega banks and their executives will be held accountable for repeatedly breaking <coughs> the law and harming consumers. The bill gives federal prudential banking regulators 90 days to review the mega banks they supervise that operate in the United States to see if they have engaged in a pattern of repeated law violations that harm consumers. A mega bank is defined in the bill as a global systemically important bank, or GSIB, pronounced GSIB, for any mega bank determined to have any such violations. The federal prudential banking regulators must, within 120 days of enactment, initiate proceedings available to existing authorities to wind down the bank and bar responsible executives from working at another bank. This project is subject to judicial review and the federal prudential regulators must testify before Congress to discuss their findings. Going forward, the bill tasks the Consumer Financial Protection <coughs> Bureau with issuing regulations to further define what constitutes a pattern of practice of violations of federal consumer protection laws by mega banks that warrant severe penalties such as restricting certain lines of the bank's business, removing and banning couple executives from working at another bank, or winding down the bank. Federal prudential banking regulators must regularly review mega banks under their supervision in consultation with the Consumer Bureau and enforce severe penalties <coughs> on any mega bank that engages in a pattern or practice of violations of consumer protection laws. Importantly, my bill would also enable the Consumer Bureau, states and local government authorities 
to petition the credential regulators to hold a hearing on whether a mega bank engaged in such consumer abuse. The credential regulators themselves will now be accountable to Congress <coughs> and the American people and have to regularly determine that the mega banks are doing what they're supposed to do serving their customers and not ripping them off. <coughs> the bill also heightens accountability for bank executives and directors. Executives and directors of all mega banks will be required to annually provide a written attestation that they have reviewed the bank's lines of business and that the mega bank is in substantial compliance with all applicable federal <coughs> consumer protection laws. In addition, mega bank executives and directors will be subject to enhanced civil and criminal liability for knowingly violating federal consumer protection laws. It is time we truly hold mega banks that demonstrate a pattern of harming consumers accountable. These institutions must no longer be allowed to abuse hardworking Americans. So I thank you, and with that, I'm pleased to introduce Congressman Al Lee, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Thank you, Thank you uh, Madam Ranking Member of the entire committee, and I'm grateful to my colleagues who are here with us today. But I'm especially grateful to you, uh, Madam Ranking Member, because as you know, the committee itself has taken very little action in this area, and it is quite disappointing to know that we sit on the Committee of Jurisdiction and that the committee has not performed its proper functions. This is a necessary piece of legislation. This legislation can make a difference. It can help us with the public perception that these huge institutions are above the law. There are people who have literally concluded that these mega banks are above the law. We don't see people being handcuffed and taken off to jail. We see people acquiring golden parachutes. They get a bonus, and they go on to the next ripoff. We have to do something more than ask for hearings that will never take place. These banks have demonstrated by their actions, by their overt manifestations, that they have a coffer that will allow them to do these things with impunity because they simply pay a traffic ticket and go on their way. Well, Madam Ranking Member, I believe you have done the reasonable, prudent, and judicious thing by allowing us to now have some legislation that will allow existing laws, allow the prudential regulators to step forward and do, quite frankly, what they could have done. But I do believe that your encouragement and this piece of legislation will make a difference in what these banks will do and in what the perception of the public will be with reference to the invidious and onerous behavior that they exhibit routinely. It is time for this legislation. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, another member of our committee who has worked so diligently uh, on these issues and have shown so much concern is Congressman Keith Ellison from Minnesota and again a member of our committee. You know, um, Congressman Waters, you know, this, this economy of ours, this society of ours, is, we call it the land of opportunity. That's our country. But in the, we are in the middle of the biggest income and wealth disparity since the Gilded Age. How did we get there? We got there through a few great things, but one thing that happened is we simply allowed these banks to get so big, and when they got so enormously big, and they bought each other up, and they merged, and they acquired each other, they got so big that their, their, their ability to regulate their own behavior just went out the door. And so when they, they know that if they get in a lot of trouble, we'll either bail them out, and if they get in more trouble, we're never going to hold them accountable. That's why this piece of legislation is so critically important. Because if you are a bank out there doing the right thing, why should you? I mean, others are getting away with all kinds of stuff. And 
There's no accountability for them. This legislation will keep good firms good and give them a reason to say, yeah, playing by the rules is the right thing to do. At this point, a bank that plays by the rules looks like a sucker because these companies are making money on taking advantage of consumers. Let me also say that, yes, it's important to raise the wages, overtime pay, minimum wage, all that kind of stuff, the right to a union, all these things are critical, I believe in them. But another missing piece of the puzzle in terms of middle class prosperity is letting consumers keep the money that they actually earn. How can they do that? As well as Fargo is over here making up accounts that people didn't ask for, charging them for life, life insurance they didn't apply for, and just draining money from people's accounts. Even if you do get an uh, 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 increase in your pay, they're going to take it right out of the out of your pocket as if you had a hole in your pocket. So we need this piece of legislation. We've got to have it so that we can have real confidence that if you work hard and by the rules in this economy, that your family's going to get prosperity. And at this point, we're not heading toward prosperity for working people. We're heading toward um, stagnation, working hours and hours and hours just to see these guys just draining your pockets and draining your accounts. And I'll just stop with this. You know. I remember John Stump came before the committee after the debacle with Wells Fargo hit the, hit the fan and hit the news. And to think that this guy <coughs> asked question after question after question, I think he must have invoked the I don't know line more than anybody I've ever seen. How could a CEO know so little about his own company? <laughs> it was really kind of remarkable. But there's one thing he did know, that he had a $173 million parachute. That's going to start. Wow. Thank you. Um, the next person to speak is Congressman Marcy Cantor. And she has constantly engaged me in conversations about these mega banks and their practices. She brings me articles. Uh, she shares all kind of information with me. And she constantly, constantly talks about our need uh, to deal with the issue of mega banks who have these kind of patterns and practices of your law. Please, most of you. Thank you, Raymond Member Waters. I am so proud of you, and I'm proud to be in the company of these esteemed members who really care about the plight of ordinary people in the rank and file in our country. Uh, our country needs them, and it needs this bill, H.R. 3937. I began my career on what was then called the Banking and Urban Affairs Committee. In 1993, after a change in the political party leadership of the House, uh, then Speaker Newt Gingrich, hit one of his first acts was to go down to the Banking and Urban Affairs Committee and to take the sign off the door and to replace it with the new name, which is Financial Services. And America entered a different era. No longer were there savings and loan institutions that cared for the home mortgages of the American people uh, with careful oversight. No longer were there interest rates where these institutions paid our people a decent amount of rent for the money that they deposited in those institutions. Uh, I think the average now is 0.5%. I can remember the day when you could earn 8 9% on a certificate of deposit, the rent that the bank pays consumers for their money. And since that time, what we found is now our country has evolved to a point where six banks, six, control 62% uh, of the money in this country. $16.2 trillion worth of banking assets. That's too much power to too few. Yesterday there was a hearing in the Senate, and one of the statements that was made for Wells Fargo, they have an employment in that company of 270,000 people. Think about that. 270,000, I thought, that's almost as big as the city that I live in. Who can possibly manage that. And the point is, they don't. They're unresponsive, they're unwieldy, they take advantage of consumers. 
So Wells Fargo is one of the institutions responsible for the meltdown of 2008. No one went to prison. The American people remember that. They remember that. <coughs> the consumer abuses that our ranking member Waters and all of our co-sponsors are trying to address. Uh, Wells Fargo opened 3.5 million fraudulent, fraudulent credit card and deposit accounts. In Ohio, my home state, 1,579 fake accounts were created. In Michigan, 2,891. In Wisconsin, 8,922 fake accounts. In Illinois, 4,890. And in Pennsylvania, 79,918 fake accounts created. Anyone that does that should go to jail. What else do these institutions do? Illegal student loan <coughs> servicing practices. Of all the people to pick on, those in our society who are trying to build it forward and are sacrificing for their own betterment. Wells Fargo, inappropriate checking account overdraft fees. When an institution is that big, they can tinker around with the decimal point and create enormous profits to the detriment of those that place their funds in those institutions. Unlawful mortgage practices, such as overcharging veterans to refinance loans. Charging customers for auto insurance policies they did not need, which resulted in some customers losing their vehicles. Based on some of the laws that have passed in this country, they say, well, you know, they're too big to fail. I like the expression, they shouldn't be too big that we can't jail. Mm -hmm. And so I say to Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Waters, uh, thank you very much for being a strong voice to bring mega banks into the rule of law for those that repeatedly engage in behavior that harms consumers. They should be penalized, they should be restructured, and frankly, they should be shut down. Thank you very much. And next we have uh, Congressman John Sarbanes, who pays a lot of attention to Don Frank, and issues that we deal with our, with our community like fiduciary. Uh, he never hesitates to join with us on the floor on many of these important issues. Even though he does not serve on the committee, he has focused his attention in this area because he understands that the Congress of the United States needs to do something about the fraudulent practices and the ripoffs that these banks have um, persisted in for so long. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Waters. I want to thank Maxine Waters for your really incredible leadership on this fighting for consumers in the financial space. Um, as Congressman Green said, the leadership of that committee, Republican leadership, is not doing its job <coughs> on behalf of financial consumers out in the country. Maxine Waters has made sure people in the country understand that and is fighting back every day this piece of legislation. Maxine is a terrific example of your leadership. We're all very proud to co-sponsor it with you. Unfortunately, our Republican colleagues, for the most part, don't seem to learn the lesson of the 2009 meltdown, which led to Dodd-Frank regulation. We do understand what that meant. We don't want to go back there. We want to make sure that the enforcement mechanisms that were created there have real teeth, and that when these institutions, these financial institutions, get too big, that there's real recourse in terms of stepping back and examining whether they need to be broken up or other meaningful steps need to be taken. Let me, let me talk to you a little bit about what bigness means. So one of the expressions that's often used when we look at the regulation in the financial space is that we need to set up some guardrails to make sure that you know we're, we're kind of keeping the vehicles of finance within the line so they're not going over the guardrail and, and hitting somebody.
But if that 18-wheeler gets too big, if it loads up too much cargo, if it's going 100 miles an hour down the road, no guardrail is going to stop it from crashing through that barrier and running over a bunch of innocent Americans. So that's an example of where you have to step back and decide maybe this thing is too big to be handled by the normal guardrails. Maybe we need to step in. When you get too big, you don't know what's happening in the outpost. We keep getting these CEOs coming in and saying, oh, well, we didn't know. Well, why didn't you know? Mm -hmm. The supply lines got too long. You know, Alexander the Great's empire came apart because they were conquering countries and they didn't know what was happening over there. And that's what some of these financial institutions are doing. So when, when the CEO of Wells Fargo says, oh, we didn't know about that. The reason you didn't know is you got too big. You got numbness in your outer limbs. You couldn't feel what was happening there. So you got to step back and decide what to do about that. When you get too big, you start to think you're really important. You start to forget who you serve. The consumer out there. You think you're all that. You start to cut corners. And then you step on people's lives. And finally, when you get too big, you can't see your feet anymore. And when you can't see your feet, you start trampling over people. And that's what these institutions are doing. So we have to put the authority in there, the mechanism, to judge. Did this institution get too big for the good of the American people? Because that's what we're here to talk about. Soundness and safety is an important measure, but consumer protection is another critical, important measure. And this piece of legislation is going to strengthen our ability and the regulator's ability to make these judgments about whether some of these institutions have gotten too big for the good of the country. So thank you very much, Maxine, for your leadership. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of our newer members, Mr. Um, with a very strong background in consumer protection. I was with her recently in her district where she has tremendous support and I have appreciated her very <coughs> aggressive voice since she's been here. So please, Congresswoman Pramila Job Hall, please come forward. Thank you so, mu so much, Congresswoman Maxine Waters for your incredible leadership, for your tremendous knowledge and for your fierceness around fighting for consumers. It's been one of the things that I've been so fortunate to watch. And thank you for allowing me to co-sponsor this bill with this incredible group of people. This bill is about protecting the American people. You know, when we say too big to fail, what exactly does that mean? Your bill is allowing us to challenge that idea and to say that you cannot be so big that you allow consumers to fail. You cannot be so big that you take advantage of veterans and students and all of the other people that these mega banks have been abusing. Operating a bank and serving the public is a privilege, not a right. When banks like Citigroup and J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo consistently flout the law, inflicting serious pain on the American people, there have to be consequences. And that is what this bill addresses. Now, last year, my hometown of Seattle took action against Wells Fargo, ended the bank's role to issue bonds and broker investments for the city following the Wells Fargo scandal. I'm proud of Seattle for doing that, but the reality is we need more tools, and that's what this legislation allows. And we in Congress need to do our job to protect consumers. This bill is a critical step to ensure that big banks know that they can't flout our laws without consequences. The Mega Bank Accountability and Consequences Act puts a stop to abuses by mega banks and ensures the financial security of all hardworking Americans. And it ensures that mega banks start to think twice before endangering their customers. If Republicans are serious about protecting people and not banks, then they should co-sponsor this bill and work with us to bring it to a vote on the House floor. Supporting this bill is about standing with the people of the United States whose credit scores have been ruined, whose cars have been repossessed, whose homes have been foreclosed on because of predatory behavior 
from the mega banks. So Congress needs to take up this act, which has had so much thought uh, and consideration given to it and by our ranking member. And I sincerely hope and call on our consumers across the country to insist that we bring this act to the floor for a vote and pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so pleased and proud to have with me some of the most courageous members of Congress, members who have demonstrated their real care and concern about and for consumers with us today. And so we have taken up this, we have taken up this legislation, uh, understanding all of the difficulties and the obstacles that we will face in moving it forward. We know that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is under attack. It has been under constant attack. But we know that they have an important role in this bill, helping to organize all of the abuses of any mega bank uh, that have been responsible for these rip-off and fraudulent activities. We know that while they have been under attack, we cannot move away from them and think somehow we can't be successful because we have all of this resistance. This struggle and this fight is about changing the relationship with mega banks and the Congress of the United States. Historically, they have had too much power. They have been in charge. They have basically told legislators what they could and cannot do. They have a huge lobby, they have a lot of money, and they have owned the Congress of the United States. And we're challenging that. We're taking this on. And no matter what it takes, we're in this fight. And we're going to stay in this fight. And we're going to continue to move forward, dealing with all of the <coughs> obstacles that will be placed before us, because we think the American people deserve more. We understand all of the work that all of us have done working with um, the reforms under Dodd-Frank, and we know uh, that the opposite side of the aisle have resisted all of the uh, changes that we have tried to make. And we also know uh, that in addition to the opposite side of the aisle opposing Dodd-Frank and opposing the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that the mega banks don't think we can do anything about them. They basically uh, turn their nose up at us. And they think somehow that the American people don't know exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it. <coughs> and I heard a member of the press once say, when we were dealing with what had happened in 2008, and we had Jamie Dimon uh, before us, the next day, one of the journalists talking about this who did not understand financial services issues, and much of the press had not delved into how it all works, and said, well, you know, Jamie Dimon knows more than the legislators. And so when he goes before them, he just talks circles around the head. Well, that may have been the perception of that journalist and that press operation, but I want to tell you, these members of Congress know exactly what is being done. We have no fear of uh, these mega banks. We're moving to utilize authority that's already in law. And it is possible, it can be done, and we're going to work it until we get it done. With that, we'll take any questions you may have. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Victoria Guido with Politico. I just wanted to, I have a technical question and then a broader question. I wanted to make sure I understand how the bill works. So is, you, you mentioned the 90-day review. That's triggered by a petition, and that's related to consumer violations? Is there some kind of size threshold? Because you've been talking a lot about how these banks are too big. Um, if you could clarify that. And then my, my broader question is, are you saying that the four largest US banks should all be shut down? Uh, what I'm saying is this. This is an example of the practices, the pattern and practice of big banks where they have basically taken advantage of our consumers, and they have been fined over and over again, and it is a cost of doing business. And if we keep going this way, they will continue 
uh, not only to create more ways to rip off our consumers, uh, but uh, we will never be able uh, to give protection to our consumers if we don't take uh, more actions, if we don't make it uh, not only very, very expensive, but criminal activities uh, for them that are doing these kinds of things. And so what we have done is we have put in a process, and that process is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will basically organize the abuses and put forth these abuses. And then there is another process that is put in place that will give an opportunity for petitions to be done and for, um, I guess, the banks to even uh, be able uh, to oppose or talk about why uh, they don't believe that they should be targeted in this way. Uh, and there are hearings uh, that could be put into the process uh, so that we are moving forward with a process that would give uh, the uh, prudential regulators all of the information that they need and the authority that they already have by which to either um, shut them down, break them up, uh, rip off parts of the bank, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Hi, uh, Brian Sean with s and Global Market Intelligence. So to kind of expand on, I guess, Victoria's second question. So it sounds like the bill would allow um, the, a breakup of a bank that has repeated uh, consumer abuses. That's right. um, you've been very vocal about Wells Fargo, obviously, yes. given the recent events. But do you also feel that repeated um, activities have occurred at the other GCIVs? And do you also think that they should be broken up? Because oh, absolutely. While we certainly uh, use Wells Fargo kind of as an example, um, the reason we basically show you uh, some of the examples of consumer abuse, abuses at the other banks is this is not just a Wells Fargo bill. This is a bill for mega banks who fall within my criteria uh, that we have identified or that the CFPB will be identified. So it's not just Wells Fargo. They may be ones that are so obvious right now because of the abuses that uh, they have been involved with that have been identified here in this press conference that everybody knows about, the fraudulent accounts that they uh, organize in their clients' names, and of course the uh, insurance, the forced insurance uh, practices that they have had. But anybody who meets the criteria, any of these mega banks that meet the criteria are uh, eligible for this process to be kicked in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, another question. Also following up on this, uh, do you understand? Hi, uh, Lisa American Banker. Um, you in the report, there's a lot of talk about uh, Wells Fargo and how the regulators dealt with Wells Fargo. Uh, so, just do you feel like the regulators should have shut down Wells Fargo? Do I feel like what? Do you feel like Wells Fargo should have been shut down as a result of? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that Wells Fargo has demonstrated. Uh, patterns and practices that are so obvious uh, that uh, they certainly qualify for being shut down. I think that you have heard the size, something about the size of these banks, and you heard about the CEO who came before us who simply said in so many words, I don't really know how parts of this bank work. It is too big, it is too humongous, it is too huge, uh, for any CEO to understand how all parts of it work. And he admitted that. So yes, they certainly qualify to be sure. If I could add on. Yes. You know, think, I, I encourage folks to think about the community banks and other institutions that lend money in our community that try to do the right thing, that try to live up to their responsibilities every day. I mean, you can have, like, sympathy for Wells Fargo if you like, but what about all the other companies that are trying to do it the right way? If you have a system of impunity, which is what I think we actually have, you're going to get abuses. And those are just some of the details listed on the exhibit that's to our left. So I mean, I, I, just to put this thing in a broader context, I mean, it is important to note that, you know, is there a consequence for really, really bad behavior or not? And not just bad behavior, recurring bad behavior. 
Yes, we are talking about patterns that um, uh, are revealed uh, constantly uh, where they continue uh, their bad behavior and that, um, yes, they are fine, uh, but they continue to create new ways by which to disadvantage our consumers and rip them off. We'll take a few more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Gina John from Writers Breaking News. Have you had conversations with regulators about why they haven't taken tougher actions? I mean, this Wells Fargo issue has been going on now for over a year or so. Um, so we've only seen really these penalties. We know OCC and others are looking at further actions, but far short of the things that you're suggesting. So have they um, given you any reasons of why they haven't taken any further action? And then uh, my second question is just sort of a philosophical one. If you're worried at all about um, creating new systemic risks by shutting down a bank that doesn't have a <coughs> solvency or liquidity issue and is more of, you know, as you say, a recidivist in, in terms of these um, actions. I, if I have not had direct conversations, uh, but you know they come before our committee uh, from time to time, and they basically have demonstrated uh, in more than one way, constantly, uh, that even though they have authority, they're just not willing to use it. And if you can recall, I think it was our Attorney General that once said that um, it was just too dangerous in essence, to break up uh, big banks because of the role that they play in our economy. No, I'm not worried. I think as long as we believe that shutting down a bank is dangerous uh, to our economy uh, because of the services that they provide, we'll never move. Uh, we cannot be held hostage by any few institutions who continue to take advantage of consumers because of some fear that somehow shutting them down or breaking them up or downsizing them is just too dangerous for our economy. I don't feel that. I don't think any of these uh, members up here feel that. And that's why we're so comfortable in moving forward in the way that we're doing. And then also there are individual actors within the bank who engage in fraudulent and deceptive right. behavior who are escaping individual criminal liability. I mean, one of the problems with this debate is, is it's always, you know, 150 miles an hour or a dead stop. There's a whole lot of room in between. I mean, and, I, and we haven't seen that. Uh, we haven't seen any criminal liability from people who engage in systemically bad behavior. In fact, as I said, John Stump got a $173 million package to walk away uh, after he, you know, basically didn't know what was going on in his bank. So, I mean, what about that? Is that, is that a concern? Um, I appreciate bringing the question <coughs> that I've heard on um, many occasions. I'm old enough, some of you are not, <laughs> but I'm old enough to remember Ma Bell. Ma Bell dominated the industry. But Ma Bell devolved, if you will, into baby bells. If we can do this with something as huge as Marbell was at the time and with the power that Marbell had, we can do this with these banks. And Marbell, by the way, did not have an adverse impact on the economy as it devolved. I'd like to add something if I could. Uh, and I'll pick on J.P. Morgan Chase at this point. Uh, our community lived through the financial crisis of 2008, the community of Ohio I'm speaking about. And uh, I could give you an hour lecture on J.P. Morgan's behavior at that point. And uh, their refusal to come to Ohio to do workouts, uh, even when they promised that they wouldn't be there. And then there were hundreds and hundreds of citizens gathered in the capital of Columbus, and they never showed. It was unbelievable. And when um, Jamie Dimon was presented with that information by me, he refused to believe it. 
So I agree with what Congressman Sarbane said that you know when you get that big, you can't see your feet, you can't see what's going on in other parts of the country. They were as one of the largest institutions in the world. They were completely unresponsive, completely unresponsive. That is not the kind of America that I want for our consumers. No citizen should face what those uh, mortgage uh, mortgagees faced in Ohio and the arrogance and the intimidation of these big institutions on institutions that aren't as big. Because those institutions have to move paper up the chain in our country. And so the big fish, right, they eat the little fish. And the little fish, even when they're major regional banks, are acquiescing. That isn't the system we should have. We should have a robust financial system with real competition. And this kind of structure doesn't allow for that. I want to just shift and also say this. If any of you have the capacity to do an article over the last 10, 15 years and look at the increasing role of Wall Street bank financing of presidential campaigns and congressional campaigns, it's a piece of information that ought to be out there for the American people. They are the biggest givers to campaigns. Everybody's on trains, I'm not up to New York City, because that's where most of them are headquartered. And it's a disgrace to the republic. The American people are restless right now. In the recent election, uh, it's interesting what happened. It's interesting what happened in both major political parties. The people are not satisfied. We have to have a system, both in the private sector and the public sector, that's responsive to the people, to the people of our country. And this banking sector is failing them. They are arrogant, they are criminal, and they are not brought to justice. Now, is every banker working in there a criminal? No, but the system is criminal. And no consumer should be treated in the way, the arrogant and disdainful way in which these large institutions treat them. It's wrong. Thank you. Uh, members of the press who are here, uh, I would like to ask you to pay special attention and create ways by which we can better communicate with our constituents, uh, with our consumers in this country. Um, I have learned over a long period of time that the way that these issues are covered do not allow us to build the kind of discussions with our consumers. They expect us to do something, but they don't always know what it is we do because we don't get enough of in-depth coverage on some of these issues. And um, oftentimes, our constituents feel that not only are we not doing enough, that somehow we are not sharing what it is we know about these institutions. We're doing the best job that we can uh, to deal with some of these issues, and they may seem complicated, but until we get you know, the front page stories and the extended discussions uh, in the press, both the print media, uh, television, uh, the social media, etc. Uh, it's going to be hard to get consumers really acting on their own behalf. Uh, they just don't get enough of the information to help them understand how they can be better advocates and how they can give better support to creating real change. So I guess if there's anything I can leave with you with today, it is first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring enough to spend time to listen to an idea that seems very difficult, seems almost revolutionary. Uh, please write about it, speak about it, talk about it, and don't do it one time. Tell your editors and your publishers that you gotta do we got to do follow-up. we got to do follow-up. So keep talking to us. We're going to try to keep this on your agenda. Thank you very much. Any members of the press, you have some public materials that we're happy to give you. You don't. You guys have received our